Chapter 6, Learning, Part 2. Basic questions we're going to be addressing in this lecture. How do we learn via operant conditioning? What various environmental conditions can be created that reliably impact learning and behavior in predictable ways? Changing behavior, what's better? Punishing bad behavior or rewarding good behavior? Besides classical and operant conditioning, what other ways do we learn? So weigh in on this independently. And this could be something that you could write about in the discussion board. Is our behavior mostly automatic and determined by environmental conditions? Advance this in one of the first lectures of this class, that the behaviorist tradition is to view the human person as being primarily a product of their environment, that most of our behavior is learned, and we learn through interaction with our environment. In classical conditioning models, we learn associations between stimuli and responses. B. F. Skinner came up with another model of learning that we're going to be talking about in this lecture known as operant conditioning that essentially states that we are, in essence, product of our environment. So B.F. Skinner was a Harvard man. He was a genius in that he was able to come up with creative ideas and theories about basic aspects of human behavior. He explained human behavior through simple, basic laws of conditioning and learning came up with his own brand of conditioning known as operant conditioning. Skinner spent a lot of time in the laboratory at Harvard, and this was the apparatus that he used to conduct much of his research, the Skinner box. It's referred to as an operant chamber as well. Here's the idea. You put a motivated organism, and this is a rat, and Skinner did most of his research with rats and pigeons, and he kept them motivated in that he kept them at about 75% of their normal body weight, so they were constantly hungry, and so they were willing to do stuff for food. And when you put a motivated organism in an environment, what do they do? Well, they move around, and so the animal would move around. So let's look at some of the details of this Skinner box. So you had a speaker, so you could emit a tone into the chamber. You had signal lights. Uh, there was a lever that the animal would, could press uh, upon pressing depending on the, on the conditions that you set up for the animal, a pellet of food would be dispensed into a little uh, door here. Uh, often Skinner was interested in looking at the effects of punishment on learning, so there was an electrified grid so that you could deliver painful electric shocks to the animal's feet. And so this typical Skinnerian setup was using an operant chamber to condition an animal to learn certain tasks, such as pressing a lever or responding to a light or a tone. So how do we learn via operant conditioning? The key to operant conditioning and learning through operant conditioning is reinforcement. And you could think of reinforcement as consequences that we experience that strengthen responses. In other words, that increase the probability of a particular behavior reoccurring. So it kind of works like this. Uh, we have a motivated organism that we drop into a environmental context. And most environmental contexts have what are called antecedents. These are rules that are either implicit, unspoken, unwritten, or explicit. They're pretty clear, but yet the environment has its own particular conditions. So those are the antecedents. And you drop an animal or a human or a non-human animal into that kind of condition, and then it's motivated and begin to move around and do stuff, that's the behavior, and then it will experience consequences of its, action, of its actions. And by experiencing the consequences of the actions, that will determine whether or not the behavior that led to the consequences will be re repeated or not. Central to Skinnerian operant conditioning is the idea of reinforcers and reinforcement. 
So you can think of a reinforcement as anything that increases the probability of a behavior reoccurring. So in Skinner's experiments and in the experiments of the behavior analysts that came after him, reinforcers were used. A couple of different types. We have primary reinforcers, which satisfy biological needs. So food is a primary reinforcer, whereas secondary reinforcers are conditioned. That is, for example, uh, if you give a three-year-old child the choice between a $100 bill and a nice, attractive toy, what do you suppose the three, three-year-old will choose? Probably the, the nice, attractive toy. However, if you give a 13-year-old child a choice between a, a, an attractive toy and a $100 bill, they might choose the $100 bill because they know they can go out and buy 10 uh, of the toys or something else that they prefer. So they learn that money uh, has value and it's reinforcing. So think of secondary reinforcers are reinforcers uh, that have been learned and primary reinforcers satisfy basic biological needs. Skinner's research primarily used primary reinforcers. So here's two examples of the two basic types of reinforcement, positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So here's how it works. We'll start with positive reinforcement. So you have the animal in the operant chamber. You want it to learn how to press the lever. So the animal presses the lever, and the consequence of that behavior is that it receives a food pellet, and that is a rewarding stimulus to the animal. So what happens, the consequence or the effect of, of the consequence on behavior is that now that tendency to press the behavior or press the lever has increased. That's positive reinforcement. The experience of a reward increases the probability of that behavior being reproduced. Negative reinforcement, how does that work? You have the animal in a operant chamber and it's having painful electric shocks delivered to its feet. It moves around until it presses the lever. The consequence of pressing the lever is that the shock is turned off. It's removed. And so with the removal of that aversive stimulus, the lever pressing behavior has been negatively reinforced, and that means that the tendency to press the lever has increased. So in both positive and negative reinforcement, the tendency to reproduce the behavior is increased. So reinforcement increases behavior. The major difference is that through positive reinforcement, there's a reward, like a food pellet, and in negative reinforcement, the behavior, the action, reduces or turns off an aversive stimulus. So concept check here for you to sort out between positive and negative reinforcement. So you tell me. Your spouse or partner has been pestering you for weeks about going on a trip together. One day you give in and agree to go. After the trip, your spouse or partner begins pestering you again, and you immediately agree just to get him or her to stop. So is that an example of positive or negative reinforcement? And we're talking about the giving in behavior as being either positively or negatively reinforced. And the answer is negative reinforcement. So when you give in, you turn off the aversive stimulus of the nagging. So that means that that giving in behavior has been negatively reinforced. And that means it's likely to occur again. Example number two, you study hard for a test and get an A. Is that positive or negative reinforcement? That would be positive reinforcement because the A is the reward, which increases the probability that you're going to study hard for the next test. So I want to talk about some of the environmental conditions that have a impact on behavior. So we're going to talk about shaping first and then about the schedules of reinforcement. Shaping involves rewarding behaviors that approximate a desired behavior. So if you've ever been to one of these shows where the animals are doing these incredible things, then chances are you've witnessed the impact of shaping. Think of shaping as having a target behavior in mind, 
Suppose you want your dog to learn how to roll over. So the animal won't immediately roll over upon command, but rather it will engage in some sort of behavior. And so the idea behind shaping is that any behavior that approximates the desired target behavior, you give a reward until eventually you've shaped its behavior so that it rolls completely over. And that's shaping. So after this lecture, I've got a video on shaping the behavior of a rat. So you can either pause this video and, and take a look at that link, or you can keep on watching and look at the link after to illustrate the process of shaping. But this is just the idea of having a target behavior in mind and then rewarding uh, successive approximations of behaviors that advance the, the organism toward that final target behavior. So take a minute and identify one behavior that you, or maybe somebody else, may have acquired through shaping. And my example here would be these games, these video games that are very popular, like Angry Birds is very popular. So playing a video game, you can think of it as shaping your behavior. So if the idea is to score points and you have to figure out how to score the maximum amount of points, then your behavior essentially is being shaped. Um, the more points you earn uh, the, for engaging in a particular type of behavior, then you can, can just consider that as being positively reinforced. And eventually your behavior is going to be shaped such that you're going to be engaging in those behaviors that will gain you the maximum points. So come up with your own behavior by elaborating your helping encode this into memory so you'll be able to recall it much better. So schedules of reinforcement, I want to talk about schedules of reinforcement, where, which are environmental conditions that we can set up for organisms, uh, humans and non-human animals that will generate reliable patterns of behavior. So the first one is continuous reinforcement. You can think of continuous reinforcement as rewarding every occurrence of a behavior. So every time an animal, such as Fido here, the dog, uh, does a high five, then you're going to reward Fido. So think of continuous reinforcement as reinforcing every instance of the behavior that, the, that you want the animal to engage in. Then we have intermittent or partial reinforcement. So we're going to talk about what are called interval schedules and ratio schedules. So these are two ways that we can set up environments to create reliable patterns of responding. So think of interval schedules as those schedules in which we're manipulating time interval between reinforcement. So that means the amount of time that passes between the behavior and the delivery of the reinforcer is varied. And then the ratio schedules were manipulating the ratio of reinforcement to behavior. So that means an animal can uh, engage in the response three times and get a reward, and then we change it so that the animal now has to behave five times or engage in the behavior five times before it gets a reward, and then the next time it's ten times and so forth. So we're manipulating the ratio of reinforcement to behavior. So we're going to look at examples of interval schedules and ratio schedules. So here are four graphs. And just to help us make sense of these graphs, I'm going to start down here at the bottom of the screen and consider this the x-axis for each of these images. So as we move from left to right, you can think of this as the passage of time. And what you're observing here and this line is a couple of things. Uh, let's just look at these marks here. So you can think of this mark, these marks as being marking the point on this uh, cumulative recorder. It's an ongoing line that's recording the uh, reinforcement of the animal, which you're seeing here with these marks, and the behavior, let's say it's lever pressing behavior, uh, over time. So this particular pattern shows when the animal was reinforced. It uh, for, for its lever-pressing behavior. And then the, the line you can think of as lever-pressing. All right, so let's start up here with the fixed ratio and variable ratio schedules of reinforcement.
All right, so now we're talking about fixed ratio and variable ratio. So ratio schedules of reinforcement is when we vary the ratio of response to reinforcement. So here the animal is, let's unpack this graph here. So as time passes, what do we see happening? So we see a very, very short period of time passing. And you can think of the line as indicating individual lever presses. So the animal seemingly is just pressing away as fast as it possibly can. And then it gets its reward and there's a very, very brief pause in lever pressing and then it starts right back up again and it gets its reward and so forth. So this is a pattern of responding that's characteristic for an organism on a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. So what does that mean? It just means that the animal is being rewarded on a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement, meaning that the animal gets its reward, it presses the lever, for example, three times, it gets its reward, it presses the lever three times, it gets its reward, presses the lever three times, it gets its reward. So let's say it's a one to three ratio. Right? So it has to press the lever three times before it gets its reward. So this leads to very, very rapid responding, very short pause after reinforcement. Let's look at variable ratio. Here we're varying the ratio. So that means here you can see the same sort of rapid responding, not quite as rapid as fixed, but still the animal's pressing away is pretty darn fast. So here we're varying the ratios. Here the animal has to press three times, now it has to press five times, now it has to press 15 times before it gets its reward. So you see that same high steady state, but the pauses go away. Pauses go away because the animal never knows how many times it has to press before it's going to get its reward. So that increases the response rate. So. Let's back up here for a second. I have real world examples for a fixed and variable ratio schedule reinforcement. You can think of a fixed ratio as being piecework. So let's say somebody works in a factory and let's say that they're assembling uh, toy cars. So they get paid for every third toy car they assemble. So on that sort of piecework schedule, you can imagine that somebody's going to be assembling those toy cars as fast as they can because they're going to get paid for every third one. The real world example for the variable ratio is the slot machine. These are those gambling devices that you put your quarter in and maybe you get a jackpot right out of the gate and then you have to pull that lever on that slot machine and put 50 quarters in before you get your payout, your next payout, and then you got to pull it five times and so forth. So that's a variable ratio. So let's look at the fixed Schedule is down here, fixed interval and, and variable interval. So let's take a look at this pattern here. So what's going on here? The animal gets its reward, and then you see it kind of slack off, behavior slows down, and then it uh, begins pressing at a more rapid pace, and it gets its reward and sort of slacks off again. So what's happening here in a fixed interval is that the amount of time that passes between behavior and reward is fixed. So that means, let's say there's one minute between reward and, or behavior and reinforcement. Uh, excuse me, there's one minute between reinforcers. So the animal knows that um, I've got to do something, right? And so I'm, I'm pressing away here. And when I sense that about the, it's about time to get my reward, I press more rapidly and then I get my reward and I kind of slack off. And then I, I have a sense of the passage of time. So I know that it's getting close to the reward again. So I press again. So what you see in this fixed interval schedule of reinforcement is this scalloped pattern of behavior. So there's that very long pause after reinforcement because the animal can kind of sense the passage of time and that it's fixed. It's only a matter of time until it gets its reward. And then over here, the variable interval is that the amount of time that passes between reward is varied. So here the animal knows, or it uh, has to wait uh, th uh, three minutes. Now it has to wait 30 seconds. Now it has to wait two minutes. Now it has to wait 
uh, 30 seconds, now it has to wait. Three minutes, now it has to wait. Five minutes and so forth. So the amount of time is being varied. What goes away in the variable interval is that scalloped effect. So again, similar to a variable ratio, when, the anim when you keep the animal guessing, essentially, in this case, it's the amount of time. It never knows the amount of time that has to pass between reinforcers. It's just going to keep pressing away at a very st steady state. So let's back up here. Real world, an example of a fixed interval schedule, and I have scheduled tests here. So I'm Classes often have scheduled tests. Maybe you get a test every every two weeks. So if we can consider the behavior as being studying behavior on behalf of students, let's say you <clears throat> you get your A for your for your test, and then what happens is that your studying kind of slacks off until you begin to get closer to the next test. So your studying behavior increases, and then you get your good grade, and then your studying behavior kind of slacks off. Over here, the real-world example is a pop quiz environment, and this is a, cl a classroom environment where you never know when you're going to get one of those quizzes, and so studying behavior is nice and steady. Because you never know when that quiz is going to appear, and it's going to impact your grade, then your studying is nice and constant. So what happens here in the variable as compared to the fixed interval <clears throat> is that that scalloping goes away. So one thing I want to mention here is how the different schedules of reinforcement impact extinction. That is, we talked about extinction in the first lecture on classical conditioning, and you think of extinction as those processes that lead to the unlearning of behavior, a decrease in responding. So what I want to do is just compare the, the fixed schedules against the variable schedule. So we had fixed ratio and fixed interval, and variable ratio, variable ratio and variable interval. So hands down, we can say that a variable interval schedule reinforcement in both variable ratio and variable interval are more resistant to extinction than either the fixed ratio or the fixed interval. That is, once you have an animal or a human in that case learning something on either a variable ratio or a variable interval, then that behavior will be much more difficult to unlearn than if that creature is set up on a fixed ratio or fixed interval. And the reason for this is, at least in part, is that because you keep the get the animal guessing, and here in the, in this case, you don't it it never knows how many times it has to press the lever until it gets its reinforcement. And here, in the in the interval, it never knows how much time has to pass is, pass between reinforcement. If you keep the animal guessing, you're going to get that nice steady state, uh, steady pattern of responding, and it's going to always sort of have a have an expectation. Of reward. Um, whereas in the fixed ratio and the fixed interval, um, it knows that uh, it's only a matter of time before it's going to get its reinforcement. Uh, so hands down, variable beats fixed with respect to extinction. In this way, if you want to uh, establish a learned behavior in, a, in an animal or in a human, you choose to set them up on a variable schedule reinforcement. That is, if you want that behavior to persist and be difficult to unlearn or to extinguish, then you'd set them up on a variable schedule instead of a fixed. So take a minute to elaborate. Either now you can pause this or, or later come up with your own examples for each of the schedules of reinforcement that we've talked about. Fixed interval, fixed ratio, variable interval, and variable ratio. Some of these concepts are a little bit tricky because there is a certain amount of technical information here. Uh, but if you come up with your own examples, that uh, will help you uh, comprehend the, the terminology and, and how these things work. And, and it will help you create longer lasting and more effective memory codes for this material. So concept, concept checked here. Uh, for us, uh, blank schedules of reinforcement, 
will tend to produce steadier responding and higher resistance to extinction than blank schedules of reinforcement. So we have our choices here. A, fixed variable. B, ratio interval. C, variable fixed. D, interval ratio. Answer is C, variable for the first blank, fixed for the second blank. So a little bit about punishment here. Uh, punishment certainly is one of these mechanisms in which we acquire or uh, cease to engage in particular behaviors. Um, if we're dealing with children as well as animals, we've got to decide which strategy is going to be most effective in helping these little creatures learn what it is that they need to learn. Adults as well. So I want to talk about punishment in a little, a little bit and then compare it against reinforcement, positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So uh, punishment, when used, has some possible undesirable side effects. So there can be a strong emotional response. Of course, if you're using corporal punishment, if you're actually hitting somebody, then you're certainly going to get some sort of emotional response. Increased aggressiveness. So corporal punishment, again, if, if you're hitting somebody as a punishment or you're, you're inflicting pain on somebody, then you can expect possibly an aggressive response. Uh, general suppression of behavior. So this is, uh, the, ceasing of, of any sort of behavior. So if, if you come down hard on, uh, for example, a child uh, and the sort of the punishment is overwhelming, then the, the child or the, the, the animal, if you're trying to teach an animal behavior not to do engage in a particular behavior, then they might stop doing anything at all, which is not what you want, because then they're not going to even engage in the behaviors that you do want them to engage in. And then, in the end, it may actually positive reinforce undesirable behavior. And you see this in classrooms. For example, if you have a child in a classroom setting, or in some cases an adult, who is acting out and they're distracting the class and you punish them, then essentially what you might be doing is giving them attention. Uh, it's negative attention, but it is attention nonetheless. And some kids, unfortunately, are growing up in environments where they've learned that they matter only through acting out. And any sort of attention is good attention for them. So the punishment actually might be a form of positive reinforcement because you're giving them attention, which is not what you want to do if you're trying to get a behavior to stop. Observational learning. Actually, I want to talk about punishment a little bit more here. Sorry about that. Um, one of the things that I want to mention with respect to punishment is that the research suggests this, that if you want a behavior to be established or ceased, then the research shows that setting an animal or a child or an adult or whoever you want to acquire or cease the behavior more than likely, positive or negative reinforcement is going to be the more effective strategy in the long run. Um, punishment is a consequence that certainly is effective in some cases in stopping a behavior. There's no question about that. But in the long run, if you want to shape a, a behavior such that it's lasting and it's, and it's a, the kind of behavior that, that you want the creature to engage in, then the research suggests that setting up a schedule of rewards, of positive reinforcing the behavior that you want the, the child or the animal to behave in, as opposed to punishing instances of behavior that you don't want it to engage in, the positive reinforcement strategy wins hands down. So one more mechanism that we that I want to talk about with respect to learning is observational learning. So certainly 
we learn through the principles of classical conditioning and operational conditioning, but we also learn in other ways, and one of the ways that we learn is by observing others. So the gentleman that you see here in the image is Albert Bandura, and Albert Albert Bandura added to uh, the list uh, observational learning, and essentially what I need you to understand about observational learning is this, that uh, children and animals, and some animals, learn through watching significant others. So, for example, children will learn uh, by watching their parents and aunts and uncles and those celebrities and sports heroes and so forth that they admire, and uh, by so doing, they'll uh, begin to incorporate some of those behaviors into their own repertoire. Um, after you're done watching this lecture, I've included a clip to Albert Bandura's famous uh, Bobo doll study. And what Bandura was interested in seeing is the effect of te televised violence on aggressive behavior in children. So uh, he had one group of children watch a an aggressive model sort of beating up this uh, inflatable clown, essentially aggressing against the inflatable clown. Then he had another group of children watch a, a non-aggressive model, and then he let both groups of children play in a free play environment. And sure enough, what you saw is that the kids who had observed the aggressive model were behaving in similar ways to the uh, to the doll, and actually they even went beyond that. They became very creative in the ways that they could aggress against the doll. So the, the take-home point is this, is that certainly we learn through the principles of classical conditioning and operant conditioning, but we also learn through observation. So concept check for us here, just to sort of reinforce some of the learning that we've done in the last couple of slides. So how were Stanley's behaviors acquired? I want you to think in terms of the behavior being acquired through negative reinforcement, punishment, or modeling. So Stanley constantly teases Arthur on the playground during recess. As a consequence, Stanley has to stay in the classroom during recess. Thereafter, Stanley does not tease Arthur. So, in boldface is the learning that has been done. So, Stanley has ceased to tease Arthur. So, is this an example of negative reinforcement, punishment, or modeling? The answer is punishment. So, punishment is a consequence that is supposed to cease behavior, it's supposed to stop a behavior. The consequence of Stanley's teasing behavior was to have to stay in during research, so the privilege of going to recess was removed, and, the, uh, and what Stanley learned as a result of the, the punishment was that he uh, is not to tease uh, Arthur anymore, and this behavior stopped. Before heading out for a day at the beach, Stanley slathers on sunscreen in order to avoid getting sunburned. So is this negative reinforcement, punishment, or modeling? Answer is negative reinforcement. So what Stanley is doing is engaging in a behavior, which is putting on the sunscreen to turn off the aversive stimulus of getting a sunburn. Right. So this is avoidance behavior. So by putting on the sunscreen, he's essentially switching off that aversive stimulus or potential aversive stimulus of getting a painful sunburn. So this is negative reinforcement. And I want to take this opportunity to, just to make sure that the difference between punishment and negative reinforcement is clear. And the easiest way to make this distinction is this. That is, punishment is going to lead to the ceasing of behavior or the stopping of a behavior, whereas negative reinforcement is going to increase behavior. That is, any reinforcement is designed to increase a behavior, whereas punishment is supposed to stop behavior. Often you see negative reinforcement and punishment used synonymously, and that would be a mistake. They are not the same thing. Students often confuse punishment and negative reinforcement, but they are quite different. So the last example here is Stanley is in a ballet class, watching his instructors, showing him a sequence of dance movements thereafter. 
He imitates the sequence of movements. Is this negative reinforcement, punishment, or modeling? Answer is modeling. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Learning objectives. Define the terms and apply the basic processes underlying operant conditioning. That is reinforcers, primary, secondary, reinforcement, positive and negative, extinction, and shaping. Identify the various schedules of reinforcement. Continuous, intermittent, fixed interval, fixed ratio, variable interval, variable ratio, and describe their typical effects on responding. Contrast punishment with negative reinforcement and describe possible effects of punishment. Discuss modeling as the basis of observational learning.